Okay. Okay. We are happy to have Sharad here from Tel Aviv University. He'll tell us about his recent uh, progress in understanding uh, how one can direct measure logical entanglement in quantum systems. Absolutely. Thank you, Vikram, and good morning to everyone. So it's actually a yeah, great pleasure to be here with this talk. So yeah, so I'll be talking about um, a recent uh, work that I developed, a proposal, basically to measure um, topological entanglement entropy using max rotation. Uh, so this work is in our head, and uh, this work is done in collaboration with uh, Shivar Kihan and Iran Tela at Tel Aviv University. So Iran is my uh, one of my postdoc advisors. Surely he is uh, another postdoc in our group. Okay, so before even I begin, uh, I'd like to give you the main take home, sorry, take home message. So in a nutshell, this work is a combination of two ideas, one old and one new. So the old one is, uh, is, is that uh, topological entanglement entropy can be expressed as the thermodynamic entropy difference of a particular quantity. I'll talk about that. And the new one is that this entropy difference, the thermodynamic entropy difference, can be measured using this uh, max correlation code. Uh, this is like a very recent uh, experimental progress along this direction also. Yeah, so this is the combination of these two ideas. Okay, so I'll talk more detail in more detail about that. So let me begin by introducing, uh, I know many of you might be familiar with uh, topological entanglement entropy, but nonetheless, let me give a brief introduction of that. So topological entanglement entropy, so I'll be calling TEE or not. It's a, uh, it's a very uh, kind of simple signature of uh, uh, a topological order in a system. It was uh, introduced in 2006, simultaneously by Hale and Priskill, and also by Levin and Gren. So, so, so to, to understand this, first let's look at what is entanglement entropy. So you take some system and divide it into two parts, A and B. And look at the reduced density matrix of one part, let's say A. Then entanglement entropy is just the one new entropy of this density matrix, so A, right? So what was shown uh, in this set of papers was that if the system is topologically ordered, and if you take this cut L to be L to be large enough compared to any correlation length in the problem, so then this entanglement entropy behaves like in this following form. There's a part which goes linear in L with some non universal alpha, and then there's this part, gamma, which is universal. And this gamma is called as topological entanglement entropy. And it was also shown that gamma is equal to log times t, where t is referred to as the total corner dimension of the topological phase. So when you say universal, the universe means. Sorry? When you say universal. Yeah. So this t, uh, so okay, I, I, let me say uh, like, like this. So gamma is a quantity which depends only on the topological phase, but alpha depends on. Um, I think that geometry and other things. It's not just, uh, yeah. I mean, temperature, all those things actually. Alpha uh, is actually different temperature also. The, the uh, edge velocity of the state. So, this is basically the edge entropy carried by the edge state. And uh, yeah, mm -hmm. that's in that way. But gamma is just a property of topology. So, T can be expressed as the uh, sum of this sum. It can be expressed in terms of this. Individual quantum dimension. So DA, so TA, the, the TA means basically this. So if I have, you know, there are anions. If I take a particular anion like A, and if I have N of them, how many distinct ways I can combine them to give a net neutral uh, configuration, like uh, typical uh, new, sorry, uh, trivial charge for me. So it scales like E or N. So if, for example, if I take an abelian anion, I mean, you, when, you, when I combine, I just get trivial uh, uh, charge, so DA will be one. And when you have non-abelian anions, you can have DA greater than one. And this just uh, kind of follows from, I mean, for non-abelian anions, this is so because you know you can follow from the fusion rules. For the simplest case, for example, over here, I'm showing the case of uh, Ising state, Ising anions. So here there's three states, the, the identity sector, the voltage state, and the field uh, myron over. So in the Vortex state is basically when the vortex part, when I combine these two, I have two channels basically. You can go to the identity sector and also the field uh, minus one board. That's the non abelian part. part. And from, for, for that, you get uh, DA greater than one. And for Laughlin states, 
where basically fractional quantum holds states with uh, one pi epsilon fractions. All the angles are abelian and uh, they all have d equal to one. And this total dimension will be just square root of m if there are m and m sectors. Okay, so this is the brief introduction. Uh, so is specific time Yes, I am only considering the first one. Scary works with uh, not your example. So, this way of thinking what is specific to that planning on the previous topics. Not your example. I understand this. Uh, like, um, Like, for example, like this definition and the scaling with respect to L, these are our two dimensions. Yeah, yeah. Like this. But this D point, like, uh, that's also a two dimensional scale. I mean, typically, because uh, I always see this annual only in the two. That's why I don't know whether if I have a dimensional case like the ordinary shape. Yeah. Which is gap and not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Because it has H scale. Is the ordinary state of the I think the ordinary state is applied to zero. Yes. By what definition? By the fact that it has protected edge. Yes, I mean, right? Exactly. So but now, I mean, I, I, one thing I'm not sure is that, uh, so like in this in this kind of definition, we also need. Um, uh, what that's what I mean. Yeah, so basically, okay. one thing is that we need this kind of uh, factor yes. integration, this science. So in the spring one <laughs> state, if I cut and change, Mm -hmm. At the ends, there are two spin graphics. Yes. One and two. Yes. Does that count as in your actual or not? I'm just asking. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, no, I am. Okay. There you go. No, I, I think it counts, but I need to think what is the, what, what, I, what I like to put as DA. I think it's a trivial DA equal to one. Yeah. So you also actually basically is in one D chains. Ah. Do you have any example where gamma is not? Yes. Yeah, yeah, because well, there, there's no L scaling, so there is no, there's no L. Scaling. Is there some universal path? There, right? Okay, there's one thing to be wrong in that shape, which will be the capitalist. Gap one is existing. So, those kinds of quote unquote, those were also called topological. Right? That's not the same. So, you, you mean the long range entanglement? Yeah, I mean, I've heard people call the holiday state the one this. Ah, that's different meaning of the word. Yeah, I don't know how I'm Yeah, I mean, in this, in this language, it's not aware. Like, like uh, this, this topological entanglement yeah. entropy, essentially, yeah. Yeah. from a certain, it's a long range kind of uh, behavior. Yeah. Like, you know, you know, you know the spaces yeah. where you have this. Uh, yeah, yeah. So the holiday state is just matrix products. Yeah. yeah. So maybe, maybe not that. Yeah. Okay, so all right. So I think I'll, I'll uh, proceed. So that is a conventional TI is in uh, two DI also. Yes. Okay. So this is more an analog. Okay. Just logical. What is the logical? Yes. Okay. Okay. So the motivation to this uh, for this uh, project was to can you measure this uh, logic in entropy? Certainly, uh, desirable to measure it and useful. Yeah. Actually, if you think about it, uh, it's very difficult to do the, do the measurement. First of all, entanglement entropy itself is a very difficult quantity to measure mm -hmm. in experiments. And so far, uh, there have been some two instances of uh, uh, in some uh, cold item systems or trap ions. And actually, uh, topological entanglement entropy, in the subleading part of uh, entanglement entropy, is even hard to measure, of course. And actually, there's, a, 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 there's also an ambiguity in defining a subleading part to something is close like you know, L. So in this original paper uh, in uh, the and Pascal, they define it uh, like that. You first of all divide into three parts, and the idea is to basically cancel the leading part by taking proper combinations. So there's A, B, C, and what is D? D is the right. I mean, the, you are embedding this thing. Like that. Okay. Don't have to worry about D. That's not entering here. So like you know, the idea is like you, when you take these proper combinations, you can uh, cancel it. And uh, actually, actually, there's a, a remarkable recent experiment, uh, which was uh, done yeah, last year. Sorry. sorry. What is this? ABC. S A B C. No, no, no. no. It's a total entropy of inputs. So each of them is the total entropy of this individual set. A is like S A M. Yeah. 
So actually, A B C is just A plus B plus C D J entanglement with D. Exactly, everything is like this. Okay, so now there was a, a remarkable uh, recent experiment which actually measured this topological entanglement entropy, but on a, a Tori code, just simulated on, on a bus, basically large scale. And uh, in this particular Tori code, this uh, this was possible because uh, okay, how do you do that? Yeah, because as I said, you know, you need to make this cut L large compared to the any correlation length in the system. But in the Tori code, the correlation length happens to be exactly zero. And uh, so you could they could do this with a few number of uh, plaquettes, basically. But nevertheless, it's a remarkable achievement. But what I want to point out is that there is no proposal to measure topological entanglement entropy in hundreds of matter systems, like for fractional quantum quantum systems. And that's a proposal that we are putting forward. Okay, to so get that, let me uh, give a brief outline of my talk. So as I said in the beginning, I will talk about this connection between TEE and uh, entropy defense, thermodynamic entropy defense that happens in a quantum point contact that you can form out of a, let's say, fractional quantum pulse state. Okay, so I'll discuss in detail about this connection. And then I'll discuss our proposal how to measure this entropy change in a typical uh, setup. Okay, and I'll summarize. Right. Okay, so, so let's try to understand the connection. So, first of all, let me define what I mean by uh, fractional QPC. So I'm looking at uh, a chiral edge state. Think of, I'll just I'll be discussing only fractional quantum hole examples here. So you have a fractional quantum hole system, two plus one d, and you have a kind of counter propagating edge states. What you do is that a quantum point contact is when you kind of constrain one region such that you allow dynamic of quasi particles between the two edges. And uh, for the fractional quantum hole cases that I'll be discussing, this this tunneling is a relevant perturbation. Which generates an uh, energy scale called backscattering temperature, TP. And then there are two interesting limits one can look at physically. One is called the ultraviolet limit, and the other is the uh, infrared limit. So, in the ultraviolet limit, this TP is far less than the temperature of the system. And in that case, this tunneling is not very strong, and you effectively have a single topological droplet. On the other hand, when TP is far greater than temperature, and that's the limit, you effectively break the tunneling is really strong. The tunneling is really strong, and you effectively break the droplet into two. Okay, they get kind of disconnected. And what was shown, uh, this is the old thing I was telling, it was shown in 2007 by Fenley and others that the thermodynamic entropy difference between these two cases is exactly equal to log D, the topological entanglement rule. Okay, so let's uh, let me try to give you uh, some reasonings to understand this, this connection. So first of all, you can ask the question, why in the UV case there is more entropy? So that is actually easy to understand. So for that, I think it's the first thing you could So this, uh, uh, this difference, yeah. uh, why would it be just lovely and not something uh, boundary dependent in addition? Meaning, ah, yes, I mean, it's that, I, 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 it's okay, I missed, it's, I, I put that in the next slide. So you also assume that, you also, you also, you also, also assume that the length change, the total length change in the process is zero. There is no length, total length change because there's also a part which uh, comes to the length, right? So if you assume that that part is negligible, then this is uh, okay. Actually, I show that in the next slide. Right? Yeah, that's important. Okay, so this why there's more entropy in the UV case that can be understood as a simple uh, um, result of constraints actually. So the constraint is that overall. We want the topological droplet to be having a trivial charge. Okay, so if I have two parts A and B, in the UV limit, I can have A and A bar excitations, such that they can add up to give zero uh, or like trivial charge. But when I break into two, individually A and B cannot have trivial excitations, I mean fractional excitations. So that means there is more uncertainty in the UV case, and more uncertainty means more entropy. That's like the heuristic way of saying that there is more entropy in the UV case. Uh, as opposed to the IR case. Now, why is this entropy difference equal to log D? Okay, that is actually a more deep result. And uh, the, the original paper was shown using uh, conformal field theory. So I'm not going to, going to go into the details of it, but I'll just give you the gist of it. So what they showed was that if they take a topological droplet and uh, of some size, so now this length L is the boundary of this droplet, okay? And if I just look at the thermodynamic entropy of this droplet, it behaves something similar to 
like we saw for the TEE. It has a part which goes linear in L. And this is basically just the edge entropy carried by the edge states, the entropy carried by the edge states. Then there's a part that is blocky. Okay. And if I break this into two parts now, then you get two log e from the other part. And as I said, if L1 plus L2 equal to L, this is the lattice preserved, then you can see that the entropy difference will be log. Okay, so this was the uh, CFT result. I'm just giving you the gist here. So, but you can actually see this in uh, more um, like microscopic, like you can actually talk, see the full crossover between the UV and IR, uh, the entropy in uh, uh, like fractional quantum hot systems, for example. So I'll, I'll give you a briefly uh, how it is done. So the example which I'll be considering is uh, the one by like the one by uh, the, of the Laughlin states in fractional quantum hot you see. So uh, it was shown in 1990 by when that the low energy theory of the edge states of fractional quantum hall is can be described as a chiral electrical liquid. Of course, I'm putting descriptions like that. You essentially have a free left mover and a right mover, and you couple, I mean, the tunneling term is essentially at when well, QPC is at, is at x equal to zero, we have some uh, tunneling term. And the fast scattering temperature is related to the strength of the tunneling like that. Okay, so. So the next step is to actually map this uh, chiral electrical liquid to what is called as a boundary semiconductor model. Okay, uh, so this there are some uh, steps to do that. No, I'm just uh, skipping ahead. And the boundary semiconductor model is essentially uh, can be thought of something like this: you have a line, and you have impurity at the end. Okay, okay. So this impurity is the QPC essentially this one. So you see that here it's initially minus L by two, L by two, but here now I'm going from zero to L by two. Like something which is like that, so it's called as folding. That's a common technique used. Okay, so now the, the reason to map to this boundary sign quoted model is that it is known that this model is integrable and uh, one can obtain this uh, the boundary fee energy that which I'm interested in using thermodynamic beta. Okay, okay, so let me give you uh, again a gist of how it is done. So the idea is that. Uh, this uh, boundary sign kind of model, VSG model, has a quasi particle structure and it consists of this following states. It's a kicking state and an anti kicking state, and then there are this, these states which are called as the breather states. Okay? So here lambda is 1 by u minus 1. So I'm taking nu equal to 1 by m. So then there are integer lambdas. So for example, uh, nu equal to 1 by 3, then I have a plus, a minus, and a breather state, like that. So the energies of these quasi particles are they're, they're like this dispersion relation is uh, massless. You just have that. Then you can write the free energy just like e minus ds, and both of them are extensive quantities in L, and they can be written in terms of the density of these excitations in R. Like this R equal to one to p. The p is like the total number of states, and the occupation probability of these excitations fr. So the beta and such method consists basically essentially uh, can determine both in R and fr. So I'm just not going to that now. And you can express this FR in terms of some auxiliary energy epsilon i. And then what you can do is that you can write the boundary free energy. So boundary free energy is the following. I can write the full free energy. And there's a part of the free energy which is not dependent on L, like subleading part of that. That's the boundary free energy. That comes only because there's an impurity. So that boundary free energy can be expressed in terms of this uh, auxiliary energies. Which in turn can be determined using this coupled uh, set of equations. So what what we do is we take these equations, we kind of solve it iteratively, it converge, and we plug it back to this uh, boundary free energy, and then the, taking the temperature derivative of that gives the entropy of this uh, impurity or the QPC part. So uh, this is the main result, one of the main results I want to show you. So as a function of this uh, dB, the batch scattering strength, you can go from the UV limit to IR limit, right? And uh, the entropy change associated is shown. So as you can see, the entropy change is like, so for example, u to the half and half, the entropy change is log root two. So D is, uh, if you remember, D is root M. So here, uh, M is two, so that's log root two. And for one third, it's like log root three. <coughs> All right. So this is the, this is the connection. So, and uh, I think I've shown you one uh, example where you can ex explicitly see the full crossover. Okay, so now, now we ask the question, like, okay, how can I measure this entropy, the thermodynamic entropy difference? 
And it turns out that uh, recently, there has been some real uh, remarkable external progress measuring thermodynamic entropy differences in mesoscopic systems. And uh, uh, I, actually, I want to bring one particular experiment to your, uh, to your attention. And uh, this one, and this is the one which is using the, uh, like the root style we are supposed to see. So this is done by the George Pope group in uh, UBC, Canada. So what they have, what they have is like, uh, they have a, a, a quantum dot. So basically they have, um, they kind of uh, simulate the Anderson model, the spinful Anderson model. So they have a quantum dot that is coupled to a reservoir and they measure the charge of this quantum dot using a charge sensor. They can change the charge of the quantum dot by changing the uh, chemical potential, okay? So I just want to show you one thing. So when this coupling of this quantum dot to this thermal reservoir is weak, okay? So they measure the entropy difference as a function of this chemical potential, okay? And when this coupling is weak, at the charge nearest point, basically when the chemical potential is matching the energy level of the quantum dot, then there are three degenerate states, like right? Okay, I also they also have this case where the interaction and this interaction U is very strong. So there, there are three states: the up state, the down state, and the empty state. So all three of them are degenerate. So again, I mean they actually get this log three, as you expect. And when they charge the system fully, the up and the down state are degenerate. I mean, you don't have the empty state. You get the log. So they can nicely get this behavior from going from zero to log three to log two. Okay. Then they study something further, like they increase the coupling to the reservoir and they study some quantum physics, like the uh, subtraction of um, the entropy due to quantum physics and so on and so forth. And there are some, some, some things which are not very clear there. And actually, this is an open, uh, open system. Okay. So the rule they take is using this maximum method. So this is the, right? yeah. So what they're doing here is they're increasing the coupling of this dot to the reservoir. Come. So this all these things are like increasing the coupling. So I mean for me, I was just trying to show you this weak coupling case. It's easy to understand. Strong coupling case to, to understand, you need uh, like some more sophisticated things, like for example, you need, typically you, you understand this is using analogy. But the expectation is that when you have, uh, when your gamma is increasing, you will you suppress the entropy basically. And you should be delayed. Uh, I mean, progress to log two should be delayed. Okay. But uh, yeah, I was not uh, referring to that. Yes, the log three step after certain So log three is a basic thing. So the model is just this. You have this, this, like, you know, uh, the spin uh, flyers model. Like, okay. So you, you can either have, a, so you can either have a spin or a down spin or an empty scale. There are three states. This is only possible when you like, I mean, basically, this is a chemical potential. When the chemical potential is actually matching the uh, energy level. So, much so, so, at this particular value, I have three states. So, you get this log three. And when I fully charge system, then I can either have a up or down. So, you get this log two. Okay. Okay. So, the route in which they measure it is using maximum relation. So, this is what I wanted to uh, take. Uh, Tell you. So, like, I, I hope everyone is uh, familiar with maximum relations, but like, nevertheless, it's just, it's just the consequence that if I take a clean energy and I can just change the order of limits, basically, I can first take this, then I can take star equal to del by del by del by del So, this, this will give me, uh, then, so this is. Then equal to this is and so this is the integral version of this maximum relation. So the idea is that you change that, so you change, sorry, you change the chemical potential from uh, some value to some another value, and you keep track of this d and dt. So that's what they can measure. So they can measure the n in the charge sensor. They can also keep the char charge and uh, measure d and dt, and then they can. Do this integral. I mean, they can have it for different different values of mu and do the integral. That's how they get this, uh, this thing. Okay. Okay. So now with that, uh, let me come to the proposal that we have. So our proposal is as follows. So we have this uh, um, fractional quantum called PPC. So our uh, idea is to first attach a, a quantum dot in the proximity of this uh, point contact and measure the charge of this quantum dot using a charge. 
So what, what do we assume? So we assume that this dot, by charging this dot, you can induce this UV to IR crossover. So that's a protein you've done in experiments. Like typically what they do is that they have a gate voltage and by changing the gate voltage, you can have this crossover from UV to IR. That can be done. And now we measure this charge using this charge detector and just use maximum regulation. So in this case, the maximum regulation would be measuring the entropy change of the full system, both the, QP, uh, the dot and plus the QPC. This is the uh, slightly not good point. And so actually, uh, yeah, we can, well, we can work it out. So the input for this uh, calculation would be uh, the free energy that I showed you in the beginning, like the calculation from the thermodynamic theta and such. That, that's the input which you took. And uh, we can uh, calculate N, like, you know, how that, uh, the N that, is, that, that can be measured by the charge detector. You can look at the DNTT. So here I'm showing you for u equal to one third. And this blue ones are for uh, new equal to one, the uh, integer quantum Hall case, just for reference. So u equal to one, there's nothing is happening. Like you just have this uh, log two like peaks that comes from, uh, from charging this dot. Okay, when you charge the dot, you get this log two. Okay, I assume that this dot is trivial, spinless case, because you have a large magnetic field, you have your spin polarized. So Instead of log three at the charge frequency point, you just get log two. So this log two piece come, and what what happens is that when uh, I integrate this quantity, you get the entropy change. What happens is that for the topological cases, this plateau just starts going down and eventually saturates at the the topological end of the entropy. Like for example, for nuclear one half, you get log root two, and nuclear one third, you get log root three, like that. Nothing happens for um, equal to one. So this is like uh, one the, the, the purpose essentially. Okay, so so now the question is like the regime of uh, validity of this purpose. So first of all, I told you um, for this thing to work, you want the length change to be negligible. I mean the entropy change that comes from the change in length to be negligible. So actually, you can estimate this uh, entropy change due to length change. I mean there are only two. Uh, uh, variables in the problem, the temperature and the Fermi velocity of the, the velocity of the edge states. And uh, we can estimate that the change in entropy of the edge can be uh, written like that, just a ratio of T by Vf times the delta L. And so the, so the uh, topological and thermal entropy is not a one quantity. So if you, if you want this quantity to be less, then essentially you want delta L to be far less than this quantity. So if I plug in typical values uh, for like Typically, a temperature 100 millikelvin and some uh, edge velocities. The requirement comes out to be like delta L is far less than 10 to the power minus 4 meters. So, for mesoscopic systems, it's well easily satisfied. So, this edge change entropy is okay. We, we, are, we, don't, we, are not, sorry, we don't have to worry about that. So, now, but there's a problem with this purpose. This we realized when we talked with experimentalists. So, we pitched the idea with uh, some experimental groups. So they pointed out that. Um, you know, we, to, to do this thing, we need this uh, charge steps to do this crossover between UV and IR. They pointed out that in practice, you might actually require a large number of charge steps to actually achieve this crossover. And then doing this natural relation to, to measure the entropy is very not really possible in practice. So then this led us to uh, look at a slightly uh, improved proposal and um, slightly more microscopic one. Uh, I just briefly mentioned that here. So the idea here is now not to put a dot separately outside, but just to have a quantum dot inside the topological uh, droplet. Okay. So you this setup is pretty called as a Capri uh, setup. So you what you have is like you have a double con uh, quantum point contact, and you have a small region which has a large charging energy EC. And now you can control the uh, uh, charge here using a gate voltage, uh, NG. So what we showed, what what we showed in the paper was that. We can, uh, in the limit of large EC, when the, uh, the charging energy is really large, this can be effectively approximated as a single QPC with a lambda effective, which can be written as an energy dependent quantity like that. Now, if I have a, a symmetric case, then lambda one equal to lambda two, it so happens that you know I can write uh, the lambda effective just uh, as a cos phi NG term, and the associated backscattering temperature take this form. So here, you see that at ng equal to one half, you, have, you always get the UV limit. Why? Because TV goes to zero. So UV limit is when the TV is like really small. So that's the advantage here. 
So now, on top of that, if I take this, uh, if I have this quantity to be more, far greater than temperature, so then I will get this UV to IR crossover by just varying this NG from between zero and one, and zero and half actually, or like half and one. So NG equal to half, as I said, it's the UV limit because this goes to zero. And NG equal to zero, TV is just TV naught, which is assumed to be far greater than temperature. So you have both the UV and IR just by varying this NG between zero and half. So yeah, so basically in this route, we are getting rid of this multiple charge steps. We just need a single charge steps to, uh, to do this. Sure, one more thing. Yeah. This lambda effective. Yeah. So you do one HP prime, which is your effective uh, tunneling, uh, right? Or to be, so you are allowing lambda effective to be complex. Which is not equal to half or. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, that's okay. Okay, so that's in some extra phase shift in the IRC. Yeah, I, actually, yes. So, uh, like, if, if, I, if you want to understand what, why this is happening, like, it's essentially because when I have this ECF, the largest term, like, uh, then it's like uh, this term is like a saddle point, like, you know. So, you basically get psi minus L minus psi L. Uh, if, if I look at the classical equation of motion, psi minus L minus psi L is just 2 pi mg. So, I plug it back to the, uh, uh, to the family term. And use some trigonometric identities and so on and so forth. You can see this uh, uh, roughly, at least you speak me. But to, to really show this, we need a lot of calculation. So this is like, like the biggest part of our supplement in our paper. Okay. Okay. So so let me. Uh, so yeah. So in this case, now what is going to be n? N is the charge in this region. Okay. So one can uh, write down formulas for that. It looks like this. So n is ng with a small correction. The correction vanishes at Zero to that half, you can get uh, some form for that. All this, so all the, for all these calculations, the input is always the uh, boundary free energy, which I calculated from the thermodynamic data answer, which I showed in the beginning. Always that's the, that's input. Okay, so one after that one can uh, look at what is dNVT, and one can integrate that to get the entropy. So so what's happening here is that you start with some temperature. So I'm just imagining you are doing the experiment. You start with some temperature. Let's say some uh, some value you get some curve like that. Okay, then I integrate this quantity. So like, there's a peak at ng equal to point half, right? So now what happens is that as I decrease the temperature, uh, uh, if you remember, uh, you know, I need to get this condition. So as I keep decreasing the temperature, I'll be going more and more towards the IR limit, right? So my peak will start increasing, and eventually it will saturate at this uh, topological entanglement. Okay. So, in an experiment, even if you, you cannot measure the full thing, like I don't know how long how low you have to go, but by just by measuring this uh, peak, let's say as a function of temperature, you can reproduce, uh, for example, this curve. Yeah, you can get this curve just by varying the uh, temperature, and maybe you can extrapolate and get the plus uh, like So this this proposal, I think, uh, like we discussed with uh, certain experimental groups, mainly uh, Frederick. P. University of Paris City and uh, uh, Klaus Enslin at uh, ETS Zurich. So there, I mean, there is some uh, efforts underway to kind of measure it in this this scale. Hopefully, we'll see some positive results soon. Yeah. So basically, that is the that's the story, and uh, that's my summary. Okay. <laughs> what what is the how do I see this second Maxwell relation, which you for this? It's the same relation. So, so the thing is that what's the chemical potential now? It's here. Yeah, it's, it's, it's easy times NG is the uh, chemical potential now. That's it. It's the same relation. This is uh, for systems where you can count charge and yeah. So it's a electronic uh, transport measurement. However, uh, we have a lot of quantum state liquid yeah, yeah. Uh, systems where the outset is uh, Yes. So we can it. Yes. Yeah. It's in the real system. It's always a question that uh, how close it is to a quantum. Yeah. You can't, you, you don't have charge. I understand. Yeah. So you, uh, you think, uh, okay. so uh, yeah, I think 
like okay, keep one point I want to mention is that at least uh, to my understanding, this is self, this is self, which is the conformal field theory itself, which is shown by Fenley and others. This seems to be a more general result. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's a general result which does not depend on uh, like a particular kind of quantum hall like whatever it is. So any topological system is this kind of result puts. And the question is like, can you induce this UV to IR crossover? Like for example, here I'm assuming uh, everything is charged, and uh, I'm, my coupling is also uh, like charge coupling, like in capacitive interaction. But if you don't have a charge uh, excitation, like then you need uh, some other kind of I don't know what, but uh, one has to think. Uh, some other kind of interaction. Yes, you you kind of create a topological system into two disconnected topological systems. Yes. So in one case, it's our field set, in case two lumpy. Yes. yes. But you can have also situations where one end is trivial and the other end is you can pick it. Then uh, difference is optimal. But like how do you measure? So the first question. So I don't know. That's like I know. So the main point is that in this process, the main point is that you have okay, please try to um, you have something which serving both as a detector and also as the thing which is doing this uh, UV to IR thing. So otherwise you cannot measure the change. Like for example, you can just uh, in a typical uh, experiment. People always do this uh, kind of thing using a, uh, let's say, a gate voltage. They can do this UV to IR crossover, but there is no way to measure the entropy in the process. So to do that, you need to do it in such a, such a manner that I can also keep track of this change using the same same thing which is doing the crossover. But that's the like the trick or like the idea which is used to extract the entropy. So actually, I forgot to mention. So this this uh, similar kind of idea was uh, like. I should have put the paper here because uh, PRL in 2019 by you know, my, my postdoc advisor and others. So they were they used a similar kind of idea uh, to basically propose to how to measure the half log to entropy of a myon of zero mode, just connected to a reservoir. So this kind of idea was used. But there, this kind of idea worked. But uh, in this case, because uh, we have to use many sharp steps to realize, that's why we had to look at a more um, sophisticated, more sophisticated idea. And which uh, Hopefully the externalist thing it is uh, it's going to work on this kind of Okay. This is one case where the logical entanglement is actually related to Yes. So yeah, so maybe uh like this is a, this uh, entropy uh, this, this connection is as for, is actually a more general thing, not just for actual quantum one cases. Uh, it's uh, even that's why uh, answering even question. Like even if you have some other uh, exotic case, the physical cases, which I think has this order. So the question is that although dynamic is very different from entanglement, differences in thermodynamic exactly. entropy can capture differences in. Yeah. So in this particular context, this difference exactly equals the thermodynamic okay. topological entanglement. So it is a zero temperature statement. Or no. So topological entanglement entropy is a zero temperature quantity, but this is a quantity the thermodynamic entropy difference that you're measuring is not a zero temperature because essentially we are like you know working at a finite temperature. But this entropy difference happens to be equal to the topological entanglement. So that that is a independent of the temperature which might be measured. No, no. So if you increase, so essentially. That is, Assuming that the system is gap, by if you use the yeah, no, yes, that's important. So that all the entropy comes from these non-trivial degrees. Exactly. And also, there is one more subtle point, which is uh, like here. I, I assume that uh, when you when you discuss everything, I assume that uh, there are no bulk positive particles. So you assume, uh, I mean, system is gap, but nevertheless, in a typical experiment, you always have bulk positive particles. Okay. So in that case. This entropy is not just going to be alpha L minus log B, then you will also have another contribution. Yeah, so from the positive. Yes, exactly. So you have log B, and actually you have plus like n alpha summation over alpha, n alpha, log B alpha. Like B alpha is the individual quantity. You have this quantity. Okay, but it is also shown in this same paper that this is okay, no problem. Why? Because when you do break this into two, the quasi particles end up in one of the droplets. But this contribution does not change. So when I look at the entropy difference delta s, I just get uh, log d again. So even though it changes the form here, when I look at delta s, it doesn't matter. So I mean, this is actually important when you do it in experiments because they'll always have a bulk of particles. So that's also okay.
Okay. <laughs> Thank you.